Hi, hello, welcome everybody. I will give some time for all of the interested participants to come and sit down. Uh, this is now the session about language modeling and the first speech uh, the presentation is coming from Milos Jakubicek and uh, Michael Rondo and this has a very interesting title so we will probably hear whether ChatGPT ends lexicography. Okay. Thank you Christina for the introduction. Uh, I, ho I hope you can hear me well. Um, my, was, my, my voice is not uh, at its best. I mean, uh, it, it was fighting with the air conditioning for two weeks and uh, it seems that it has lost today. Uh, so this is going to be a two-man show. Uh, I'll be talking about the boring technical bits and then Marco will be doing the interesting evaluation. Uh, so I will try to be fast uh, with the boring stuff, but, uh, you know, um, just one week ago, two weeks ago, one of my colleagues was defending his PhD thesis and one of the reviewers said, let's talk about the elephant in the room the chat GPT. So in a way, uh, chat, GTP, chat GPT is the elephant in the room for the whole conference here. Uh, and the question that, you know, we might be asking is, can it outperform current tools for post-editing lexicography or for lexicography as such? Um, it doesn't really make sense to introduce chat GPT uh, in, um, you know, great detail, I think. Uh, you all have heard about it, you all have tried it, I believe. Uh, it was initially released in, in December 2022. Uh, it raised general excitement all over. In a way, I think it's been the best promotion for Corpora ever, right? I mean, uh, people were trying, Adam Kegarif was trying to promote the use of Corpora, one of the headlines of uh, lexical computing uh, used to be, you know, Corpora for all. And, um, you know, suddenly everyone knows what, what a corpus is. And I've been reading newspaper, newspaper articles uh, saying that the OpenAI company invented, invented the term token, for instance, like uh, quite interesting. Um, so the only thing that I would do is kind of mention the things that I think are kind of stable, considering the fact that, you know, ChatGPT is heavily being developed and, um, you know, it's a, say, uh, a product that changes uh, every month. So w what are the properties that are kind, kind of likely to stay at least for a while, right? Um, oh, yes, uh, the general excitement. Jean Maurice, where are you? Here you are, okay. So the part of the general excitement uh, that I wanted to mention was the end of lexicography uh, by Jean Maurice back, back in February. Uh, thank you, that, it, that inspired our talk. Um, and, uh, well, the question that we really want to um, ask is, um, can it take all over dictionary makers task or not, or um, is it going to happen in the, in the near future? Um, I guess the most important thing uh, about ChatGPT or GPT generator to realize is that it's language modeling, not language reasoning. I mean, there is no logical inference in a formal sense whatsoever. And it's also not a knowledge base as such, right? And that's, that's two things that, uh, you know, the general public sometimes thinks and frequently confuses. It's a language model that performs token sequence generation. And it performs this generation by probabilistically looking through what it has learned from the training data. Um, there is no source data reference. It's, and it's not really easy. I mean, um, you know, I, I say not easy in the paper. I think Pavel was then correcting me saying that sounds like they might edit soon, but that's not going to happen. It's not easy to, you know, uh, somehow tweak it so that we would know where the responses that were generated come from. Why does it what it does, right? Um, it has a rather limited prompt and response length, right? Uh, so, um, at the moment, I think the um, uh, response length uh, in the paid uh, API is limited to 4,000 uh, tokens, which are not even 4,000 words, right? Uh, and under some scenarios, one can get up to 16,000. But there is no way that we could um, realistically think 
of generating, say, millions uh, in a sort of near future. Um, it performs translation through multilingualism. 92% of the training data, uh, which are very poorly documented, as I, I think many of you have heard, so 92% is English. Uh, and the translation is kind of built into the model. There is no separate translation system. Um, as a result of that, um, using ChatGPT for bilingual lexicography um, you know, is quite hazardous, actually. I'm giving, we are giving examples in the paper, but basically whenever you try um, to generate um, word sense distribution for uh, a non-English word where the English counterpart has more senses, you will get the English senses translated back into your source language as a complete garbage. A prompting is absolutely crucial to get the right response. And uh, we can expect that in the same way like uh, people were um, doing Googleology by trying to figure out how to ask Google to get the, the best answers, now we, we will have this GPTology by people you know, trying to figure out what prompts uh, are best in terms of getting the right response. Um, and uh, both the learning and the inference are non-deterministic. Uh, non-deterministic learning is quite standard with neural networks uh, for various reasons. Uh, in the first place, because the initial weights are typically assigned at random. Uh, here, also, the inference is typically non-deterministic. Uh, it can be tweaked so that it is deterministic, deterministic uh, affecting the quality of the output. So typically, it is not done. Uh, and that means that, um, you know, whatever you do is of very limited reproducibility. You try something, you show to your colleagues, they retry, they get something completely different. This definitely affects also the reproducibility of our own study. Um, and the model is kind of static. You can, um, you know, um, perform some additional training, but as of now, you get all these warnings that it has data until 2021, uh, and you get workarounds like various types of plugins into it to access newer information. But um, as it happens in machine learning, you train, you get a model, that's it. Okay, so now what did we do? Um, we have made an English mini dictionary consisting of uh, not even 100 head words that uh, were uh, reused from uh, the Dante project, which some of you uh, might remember, uh, collaboration between Forrest Nagailge, the Irish Language Institute, and Lexicography Masterclass, the company of uh, Sue Atkins and Adam Kilgariff and Michael Randall, uh, that uh, no longer exists, uh, back in 2006, eight, something like that, right? And this was uh, a sample of head words that, uh, that they chose back then to sort of uh, make a very, uh, very, uh, very heterogeneous um, uh, sample of different parts of speech, um, single words and multi words, sort of to test for um, how it would, uh, how, how, how Dante, what Dante would look like uh, for, you know, very, very variant head words. So we reused this sample uh, and uh, we, asked three questions three times because of the limited reproducibility, altogether obtained some 300 answers. Uh, we asked three times because of the reproducibility and we asked three questions because um, chat GPT is GPT fine-tuned for chat. There, there is some additional tweaking for the chat purposes and, and you quickly realize that, uh, you know, um, the longer you ask, um, it, the length, Asking three questions and one question is simply not the same. There is some, um, you know, built-in reward mechanism in the training in terms of that it likes to chat simply. So we sort of primed by first saying, okay, what does the word H mean? Then asking, generate a dictionary entry for H. And finally, um, asking the full question uh, in, the, uh, in the third line, right? And we kept all the three answers from all the three runs. Uh, we loaded them into Lexonomy, and that's where you can have a look. By the time I was doing this, before the uh, deadline for submitting abstracts for Elex, there was no API whatsoever for ChatGPT. That was just after Christmas. 
Um, so I uh, used a workaround uh, that uh, someone has quickly uh, put together that was simulating browser access as if one would be clicking in the interface and collecting the answers. ChatGPT kicked me out like, uh, you know, once per five minutes. So uh, getting the 300 answers took about three weeks or two weeks or something like that. Uh, but, you know, we made it. Then later we repeated once the API was published uh, and the model was coined as 3.5. Uh, and that's the other dictionary. Uh, ChatGPT4 did not have the API by the time we were preparing the full paper. It now has, even though with some limited access. Um, and this is it for me. So I will just gladly uh, hand over to uh, to Michael uh, to discuss what you can find in the dictionary. When is it working? through uh, these sort of main uh, entry components. I mean, it does other stuff as well, like morphology and so on, but that's kind of easy and fairly trivial for us to do in any case for uh, better to uh, look at. So we'll start with words ends induction. Um, and there are, there are three problems that um, seem to arise. I think there are quite a few problems. Uh, not surprisingly, words ends disambiguation is a inherently difficult task anyway. and it's difficult for human beings, and no two human beings will necessarily divide up the semantic space in the same way. But what you get with ChatGPT, and this comes up a lot, is firstly what we're calling false polysemy, where you it gives you a number of senses, but actually they're all the same one when, when you look at them in, uh, in any detail. It misses quite common senses too, and then it, it will invent some as well, and I'll show you some examples. This is the entry for climate uh, in our sample. Um, and I think there's really only one meaning for it. Um, possibly two, but you, you, you get the idea. I mean, it, it just sort of, it's repeating itself. It doesn't really understand what word sense mean. But <laughs> and I, I get that, it's quite a hard concept. But So there's that, but there's a sort of very well-known, uh, this is missing senses, uh, a very well-known use of climate uh, metaphorically used, which is extremely frequent. It's not a rare use. It's, I mean, you'll find it in absolutely any dictionary, even quite an elementary one, um, as shown by these concordance lines. Um, oh, still time. Uh, yeah. This is an invented sense. Um, butter. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, the, a personal thing that's easy to defeat or manipulate, pushover. I have tried to find evidence for that. I, it's, I really don't know where this comes from. It's, it's, it's one of the fascinating things about that GPT. Uh, easy to manipulate, and she found the exam to be a piece of butter. Piece of cake, maybe, but... Um, um, and it looks so plausible, doesn't it? Um, it's got... Um, I think Ilan was saying something like this earlier, earlier in the week, that... Um, its fluency is rather deceptive. Um, it looks so confident the way it comes up with this stuff. Um, so that's that. Whoops. So yeah. So senses. We we have uh, the repetition, um, same sense, done several times. Um, the invented senses and the missing senses. So that's not great. Um, Definitions. Um, definitions are generally pretty good, actually. Um, can you guess what that's the definition for, the last one at the bottom? Um, person who spends a lot of time sitting and watching television or playing video games and is generally inactive. Couch potato, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it works works in that direction, too. Um, and I think it, its account of the word careful is, is pretty good on the whole. Um, next, uh, yeah, a, a lot of problems with uh, grammar and, and syntax too. Um, this uh, second meaning of haunt uh, does evoke a real, a real use of the verb, um, but you find in the, the definition, <laughs> it's the definition of a verb, but it's got a kind of adjective phrase followed by a noun phrase. Um, it's a real meaning. Um, you know, you talk about a decision someone makes 
which later comes back to haunt them and so on. So it's referring to something real, but it's not doing it um, in a very intelligent way. Uh, problems with grammar and syntax also, this is, uh, let me show you what I'm looking at here. Uh, uh, oh yeah, okay. This is, uh, Milos was talking about it being non-deterministic, meaning that you get a different answer every time you ask the same question. Um, and this was two questions for Enjoy. It was actually a separate experiment. It's not, not in the uh, lexonomy data. Um, but you can see that number seven there is a that clause. Um, I've deliberately used the word normal. Um, uh, this is something that I, I always I learned from Patrick Hank. He always says, um, don't, don't ask whether something is correct. Ask whether it's normal. So you may find this occasionally, but it's really not normal. Um, it's, oh, uh, it's really not normal to say uh, to have enjoy with a that clause, and then on the other column, when you ask it again, you have an infinitive, uh, and you will quite often get that in the English of people whose first language is not English, but it's not a normal uh, pattern. In, uh, if I can say it, native speaker English. Um, so, sort of unreliable on that front. Uh, Labelling, often quite good. Uh, any kind of marked use, whether something is uh, in some way not descriptive uh, in text and, and found in only certain types of text. So, betimes, um, it doesn't give an ar a label archaic, but it says at the bottom it's, it's an archaic word. Oh, and its use, it, yeah, okay, well, that's not very good, is it? Uh, it apostrophe s usage is rare in modern English. So apart from the uh, rogue apostrophe, that's a pretty good thing to say. Cookie, um, well, uh, the third one, okay, it gives a kind of domain label, computing, computing cookies. The fourth one is another made up, another made up meaning, which at least it labels as slack. <laughs> um, there is a kind of related one where the word cookie can just mean a person and in, uh, of the specified type. So you say someone's a tough cookie or she's a smart cookie, etc. But this thing about being attractive in a sexual way, it's, it's a new one on me anyway, put it that way. I'm, and I'm, I'm quite old and quite well read, so <laughs> I don't think it's um, a real one. Example sentences, uh, uh, this is really, I would say, where it falls down most. And, and conversations I've had with other people who who works in chat GPT, uh, Robert Leff, for example, and, and, and others, and Erin McKean, actually, who saw last week in Asia List. Uh, we all had the same experience that you've got five examples there, and apart from the last one, which is actually in the present tense, um, well, first of all, they all have initial the. There's an absolute lack of diversity in the kind of examples, which is something that I think we always look for in, in a dictionary project, you know, because I'm kind of coming at this from a point of view of a dic being a dictionary uh, editor. So you can see that they all have the same pattern um, of, you know, uh, it starts with the, um, it's a third person subject, and the simple past, uh, which in the olden days was always a very um, accurate marker of a made up example, and not a very good one either. Um, and again, uh, this is in a separate experiment. Look at these ones for fair. Absolutely terrible. Um, the price of the item was fair, not too high and not too low, um, reaching to the Gricean maximum quantity. Um, and then the last one, I, I got this from Robert Lev. He had the same experience. The salesperson persuaded the customer to buy the product. There's three definite articles in there. It's pretty awful. Um, so, just a summary of that, um, word sense induction, weak, grammar and syntax, weak, labeling, often quite good, uh, examples, uh, I'd say sackable offenses, I mean, anyone on, on my team came up with these, I would sort of, they'd at least get a good talking to. Uh, definitions, definitely a strongest feature, I think, I think most people agree with that. Um, it does use quite often these rather dated formulae, like the act or the state or so on and so on, but but the examples, I mean, the definitions are generally accessible, readable, they're good, for good in terms of content, and often uh, nicely written. Um, 
And, and that applies whether we're looking at uh, mainstream vocabulary or technical vocabulary. And even, even the things it makes up, it does it quite well. Um, so just to finish off, because uh, I know I'm overrunning here, um, I don't want to sound too negative. I mean, I think it's incredibly impressive. Um, and I think there's plenty of scope for improvement. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's early days. This is, this is a very new phenomenon. And um, there are, th you know, the improvements both in the system itself and in the way we use it, the way we learn to use it. And, and I think what we need to have is, is to look at prompts and evaluate, or have, have a sort of proper evaluation of those and um, figure out what works best. And I think a lot of the weaknesses that we've identified here are actually fixable. Um, I mean, I t again, I talked to, to Robert about his, he had these awful examples, and he actually managed to sort of train the system to do better and to produce a more diverse range of examples. So that, that's all sort of doable. Um, so we go back to our title of, what was the title? Can Chat GPT outperform, outperform current tools? Uh, well, I mean, not a sort of spoiler alert. The obvious answer is no um, at the moment. Um, and the thing is, we, we, we're not judging Chat GPT in a vacuum, but against what we can already do with the tools that we have. And you know, we've been, we, lots of us have been developing over the year, over 20, 25 years, tools for automatic dictionary compilation. Um, and I guess the state of the, the art at the moment is the sort of post-editing model that uh, Milos and his colleagues have, have, have demoed on numerous occasions. Uh, it's sort of more modular. That's a big difference. It's more modular than ChatGPT. In other words, you, you, you have different aspects. <laughs> Fifteen centimeters. So I got like half a minute. Um, different components in the process, and, and you tackle each of them one by one. Whereas ChatGPT, you just say, "Give me a dictionary," and uh, that's it. So uh, there's a lot, and, and there's a lot more work in progress, which will feed into the post-editing model. I guess. These things are actually too short this afternoon on some areas where they're currently in. But, um, but I do believe it, it. It definitely can make a contribution, if only because. Um, because it's good at definitions, and in the post-editing models we use at the moment, that's the very area, the precise area, where uh, we're, we're still quite weak. So uh, there should be scope for some sort of hybrid uh, work. Sorry, Christina, I'm over there. But, um, so I, I think that's, that's us, and I think we're done. Thank you so much. This was a nice introduction to our panel discussion. We have a few minutes for questions. Hello, and thank you very much for the very inspiring uh, presentation. Um, I, I've heard some presentations about ChatGPT, but I still have a s very small picture about it. But um, I, was, uh, I wanted to ask, you said that the, um, the definitions are the strongest feature. Um, is um, how m I wanted to ask how much of the generation is actual generation, uh, or c could it be that ChatGPT just searches the definition and then we see the def and edits it a bit, and then we see the definition and says, yeah, well, it's everything is generation. It's just generation. It's just generation. Just okay. generation. Perfect. I mean, I see it to um, give me a definition. Uh, this is in another experiment where it says. You ask it for a definition of something, and it says, yes, according to Merriam-Webster dictionary, it's this. And then you look in Merriam-Webster dictionary, and it's not there. It's made it up. Uh, it still looks like a Merriam definition, and it's quite a good one, but um, it's not real. It's a hallucination. I, I have found exactly the case, and the definition was OUPs. <coughs> Thank you. It's very interesting. One way you might be able to fix the example problem uh, is to use corpus. I've made some experiments with simply pasting com corpus concordances into ChatGPT and say, please find some good examples in this, shorten them, tidy them up, and use them. And it provides much better examples than when you just ask it to use introspection, basically. Yes, that's what we do. <laughs> that's kind of what we do already. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, can you feed a corpus? I mean, thing? not really. I mean, Okay, yeah. one more question. Just a quick and stupid one. Have you tried it with made-up words that kind of seem to be real words and 
Uh, well, I haven't, but well, I, yeah, I, I, have. you get answers for plenty of questions that you ask for, right? So yes, of course, it tries. Okay, uh, it, is there maybe a very short question or a comment? Okay. Um, so I would like to ask, how did you prompt to be able to get the label um, for it? It made it all by itself, so we didn't, oh, okay. you know, we, we, the we, we literally asked the three questions that I was showing, yeah. nothing else. Yeah. Because when I was trying to do it yeah. in my research, it just gave positive and negative. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't get that um, the same answer, so that's another problematic thing about ChatGPT yeah, as well, I, I guess. There was one thing that really did look like a label, didn't it? A domain label, it said bracket computer. So that looks like a, a dictionary label, but in the case of um, betimes, it was more a descriptive thing saying this is an archaic word and so on. No. No. Yeah, no. no. I mean, but, um, I, I don't think there are actually big changes or big differences <laughs> between the two. Okay, we are out of time. Now we have a few minutes to change the rooms if you want and then continue in three minutes. Thank you.